a look right now. You can see an aircraft going over the sky. That is into Gaza, where our next interview brings us our next guest, Mansoor Schumann. He's a Gaza resident who's been on the ground the entire time, uh, sharing with us uh, the latest on the scene as we continue to follow this ongoing conflict and those battles that continue to play out in Gaza. Uh, good afternoon there to you uh, in the Gaza Strip, Mansoor. He's live in Khan Yunus, where he's been really pretty much the whole time. He's kind of shifted his role from really a civilian to becoming more of a citizen journalist there, sharing with news outlets really across the country, across the world, uh, what is happening on the ground. Thanks for joining us, Mansoor. Thank you, Jack. Merry Christmas to you and Happy New Year. Uh, thank you. Happy holidays to well uh, to you as well and to your family. I know you have several children. Your wife there still on the ground. Uh, it is a desperate situation from what we understand in the Gaza Strip. I'm hoping you can share with us really what the latest has looked like in terms of IDF operations as they continue to push into Khan Yunus. Uh, and what does it look like in terms of the people that were in Gaza and now starting to shift further to that very crowded south near Rafa? Uh, yes, so the landscape has changed since we last talked. Um, I think we last had a conversation uh, before the first ceasefire was announced. And at that time, uh, the IDF was focused in their land invasion military operations on the north, in addition to casually bombing the southern areas. At that time, 47% of the casualties were in the south, even though it was a designated safe area for civilians here in Gaza. However, after the ceasefire ended, the South became the focus uh, of the IDF, um, in addition to the middle region, while withdrawing the troops from the north, from Gaza City. Um, right now, uh, I am still in Nasser Hospital here in Khan Yunus. I've been here for 75 days. Like you rightly said, my focus has now shifted towards being more of a citizen journalist, trying to talk to different news outlets like yourself across the world, telling them in English what I think is happening on the ground to 2.3 million displaced Palestinian civilians right now. Uh, most of them right now are in the south. Around 1 million are in Rafah. And uh, around 700,000 are in Khan Yunus or in, Nasser or in Nasser Hospital and vicinities. So um, uh, every day um, we see ambulances coming back and forth. Airstrikes do not stop. Spy drones keep buzzing above us. Um, uh, um, honestly, just, just keep bothering us and not, not allowing us to sleep. Um, I mean, right now, people are like, um, uh, when, you know, whenever, they, whenever you ask them what, what do you think is going to happen or what is happening or what's your message to the outside world, people feel that um, with over 25,000 dead and around 60,000 injured, thousands that have been that are under the rubble uh, they feel that just complaining about what's happening is not useful anymore so uh, they're more focused on staying alive staying steadfast staying resilient versus what is happening right now because it seems that, uh, that the outside world doesn't care except if the, 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 the if if you are strong if you are resilient if you are confident if you are doing the right thing so um, I think that's what most people are trying to do. They're just trying to survive. They're trying to remain strong. In addition to trying not to repeat what happened to our ancestors in 1948 and 1967, when they were forced from their homelands in many cities and areas in what is now called Israel and forced to be refugees in Gaza, in West Bank, in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and in many countries around the world. Do you have great concern now as more and more people continue getting pushed to the south, at least in the Gaza Strip, uh, much of the north not even occupied anymore, though there are still some refugees that remain there, some Palestinians. But as the IDF continues its operations, it appears that uh, the strip of land, the pieces and the homes that uh, people were in uh, are starting to get moved out. Is there a concern that they won't be allowed back in? 
So right now, um, the, the logistics is not possible between the middle region and the northern region. Uh, the IDF controls both main highways on the sea and on Salahuddin Road uh, on the east. So aid is not allowed to reach um, our brothers and sisters that are there in the north. We have around 500 to 600,000 people still living in Gaza City, still living in Jabalia, Beit Lahia, and Beit Hanun. Uh, there is a lot of concern regarding the lack of aid that is supposed to reach them. Relatively speaking, the middle and southern regions are better. Uh, but still, aid is only trickling in. It's um, like I said before, honestly, the Rafah border is not really open. Aid is only trickling in. Not everything we need is allowed to come in. The quantities is around 2 to 3 percent of the actual needs. And most of it is still in the UN warehouses waiting to be distributed to civilians that are in need in over 200 refugee schools, many hospitals, mosques, churches, and open land areas all around Gaza. In what I think is the biggest humanitarian crisis right now of the 21st century. Um, uh, uh, Giacomo, uh, I mean, uh, I, I know that it's, 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 it's rough and, and it's tough to talk about this, but uh, I mean, one of the things that, that keeps stuck in the back of our minds is, is how we see uh, the, the many civilians that the IDF army took, especially in the north, especially around Gaza City, and humiliated them and took their clothes off and took them to unknown areas. Many of them reportedly killed, many of them reportedly now injured. I personally met and seen many of them here in Nasser Hospital coming to us from the north, telling us the horror stories that they faced there by the IDF soldiers themselves. We hope as soon as possible for this war to end, a ceasefire, a permanent ceasefire to happen as soon as possible, borders to open, aid to come in, and hopefully a peaceful resolution as soon as possible for both sides so that this humanitarian crisis does not continue any more longer. Now, our understanding, though, is that Hamas has rejected any sort of ceasefire that would end with the end of Hamas ruling Gaza. There's been conversations about the Palestinian Authority potentially taking over Gaza once Israel finishes its war, its operations in the Strip, but no clear sign of what exactly will happen next. Is there a common consensus among the people living in Gaza right now, such as yourself, on what you think should happen? Is there a want uh, for what is to come next? I, I think the most important thing here is that they don't want a temporary ceasefire. They want a permanent ceasefire. The people here want a permanent ceasefire. Um, uh, we, we, already, we already went through the, uh, the experience of a temporary ceasefire, and we saw the aftermath is even more vicious from the IDF against the civilian population here. That's why I think the push is towards a permanent ceasefire solution. And that, I think, is the focus by the uh, negotiation parties uh, led by Egypt and Qatar, trying to bring both sides uh, closer in terms of what should be agreed upon. Uh, I think the number one thing asked by everyone is a permanent ceasefire and not a temporary one. People want to go back to their homes People want to go and see their relatives, want to meet their loved ones. Even if they live temporarily on a tent in their land, they feel that they are home. But having uh, a temporary ceasefire, Allah, having a temporary ceasefire uh, shows that there's uncertainty. Not sure if we are going to stay living in a place like last hospital or we can go back home. But I think the number one thing is a permanent ceasefire. This is what needs to happen as soon as possible. Uh, meanwhile, Mansoor, we know that limited aid is being allowed through the Rafa border, uh, of course, after it's been checked by Israeli Defense Forces, our understanding it's taking time for that to happen. What is being allowed through? What isn't being allowed through? And can you say from folks on the ground, what is the greatest need at this point? Uh, I'm not sure what is not being allowed through, uh, but uh, what we are seeing now uh, in the markets, what we are seeing um, uh, at, at the UN warehouses, uh, what we are seeing as some of the local traders who we are able to, to, to buy in bulk from when it comes to charity work is a lot of different canned foods. Uh, there is uh, some uh, cattle that is being allowed in, so cow, sheep, 
turkey, uh, chicken. Um, there are some uh, some clothes, uh, blankets, uh, things to keep warm. Uh, there is, there has been a field hospital that has been set up here. Um, uh, we have seen uh, a couple of trucks, a couple of fuel trucks come in in order to ensure that electricity doesn't stop running. I think the most important thing is the continuation of the arrival of fuel trucks, because without fuel, there is no electricity. And without electricity, a lot of the vital um, support needed to run different operations here in, um, in Gaza uh, will not be available anymore, especially communications. Uh, several times we had uh, a lot of communication outages because the, the, the local stations providers here have run out of fuel. Uh, many times the hospital we are in, Nasser Hospital, is the main hospital now providing services to the community here, came close to shutting off except for the solar panels that kept it running and the, the vapors of, of fuel that were left in order to keep it running. So fuel is the most important thing. We have seen uh, more food, more clothes come in over the last few days. But like I said, I think it's not enough for even 2 to 3% of the actual needs of the, of the population here. Um, and we, we are not sure um, what is the situation in the, in the north. We, we need to ensure that this aid reaches the, the population in the north. We have half a million people still waiting for aid. And we do know that the United Nations recently in re report said that Gazans are perhaps the hungriest people in the world at this point, and that is likely true, uh, given that ongoing uh, necessity for aid and a lot not getting through as well. Mansoor, we saw you, I saw some images on your Facebook page where you had posted uh, as part of a give out for uh, a baby formula, which I imagine is uh, something greatly needed at this point. Um, uh, tell me about that type of event and, and some of the other, um, I, sp I suppose, humanitarian efforts happening on the ground from volunteers within Gaza or other aid organizations working within the Strip uh, to help people who are suffering right now. Yeah, after making over 80 different live and recorded appearances on international TV stations, and having also very active social media platform accounts trying to get the message across to the world about what's happening here. I got a lot of people asking me, Mansoor, how can we ensure that we can donate and our funds reach the displaced civilians here in Gaza? So in the beginning, I was referring to the different organizations, but it was obvious that um, the aid was stuck behind the Rafah border, wasn't able to come in. Um, so we found ways in order to ensure that these funds reach directly the people in need here in Gaza. And we are able to have um, a lot of different campaigns, similar to the one you talked about, for example, the milk products formulas, where we buy in bulk hundreds of different um, uh, milk containers, and we distribute it based on uh, prepared lists sent to us by hospitals or by refugee centers or families in need who have babies, who cannot afford these milk formulas, who cannot breastfeed, and we distributed it, just distributed it together with volunteers who are dedicated to such tasks. So, yeah, a big shout out to the free people of the world that want to ensure that the displaced civilian population here in Gaza are not alone and that, that, and that and are supported uh, by all means. Thank you very much for that. And I'm sure it's uh, much needed, but so many people, I'm sure, thankful uh, and willing to help given the ongoing situation. Uh, meanwhile, the Israeli Defense Forces, they continue uh, their efforts on the ground. Uh, what does it look like in Khan Yunus? Is there active fighting? Is there continued explosions? Is it all of the above? Yeah, I think it's all of the above. Um, uh, the Israeli tanks um, has, have, did, have, said, have, uh, have come as close as 300 meters to the hospital. Um, we keep getting messages on our phones, emergency messages that uh, the, the zones, the areas um, adjacent to Nasser Hospital are now war zones and that we need to leave it as soon as possible. Um, some people have left, but the, 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 the majority have decided to stay saying there is no, no place safe for them to go to. And the place they know is better than the place that they don't know. Um, again, we are in the hospital and we also have a more so every day we see scenes of death, 
uh, a lot of innocent elderly women and children being killed, being maimed, uh, lots of amputations happen. Uh, but in addition to that, there's also a source of life. I mean, beside me here is the maternity ward, which was also bombed uh, two weeks ago, killing a female patient uh, and injuring many babies and women. But lots of life, new life comes. And every day, you know, we are seeing new children, new babies come to life. So that gives us a source of hope uh, to the future. And hopefully that the new generation will live a better life than the generation that currently exists here in Gaza, a life full of prosperity, uh, peace uh, and love and freedom, not only here in Palestine and in Gaza, but for the world at large. Now, you've remained in Khan Yunus the whole time there in southern Gaza as this offensive has gone on for more than 80 days now. Fighting, rocket fire, so much happening there. Is there a point that you've decided with your family that you would decide to flee further south, maybe into Rafa, uh, in attempts for your, uh, to, to get to security? Um, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I know I know three families, three close friends' families, who left Khan Yunus to Rafa, and all three families got bombed, either directly or indirectly. Many we've lost in, in totality. Uh, some of them, their children, um, uh, they lost one of their children. Another one, uh, the, the wife lost her eye and lost one of her one of her legs. So. Unfortunately, there is no safe place, neither in Rafah, neither in Khan Yunus, neither in Deir al-Bala, Gaza City, or the, or the, or the north. Um, um, there is no place safe here in Gaza Strip. That, that's the reality of the situation. And being in a place that we know, with friends, with family, with connections, with the ability to get food and water, communications, is better for us than going to the unknown and being also unsafe there. So, uh, no, I think we're deciding to stay where we are right now and um, hoping for the best. Mansour Schumann there in the Gaza Strip, a resident. He's also a Canadian a citizen and a Palestinian who's remained in Gaza for more than 80 days since that war with Hamas began as Israeli forces now uh, continue to uh, operate in the area surrounding his home. Uh, Mansoor, we wish you and your family safety as you head into the new year as well. We wish uh, and send many prayers to everybody in the region right now that continues to suffer. Mansoor, anything we haven't asked you, anything you'd like to add? No, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank the audience for listening and for hearing both sides of the story. And I wish you a really happy new year and a Merry Christmas. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Mansoor Schumann there joining us from the Gaza Strip today.